Ahead on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. How the sage grouse issue is impacting cattle producers in the West. Plus, we'll head to Texas to get expert insights on controlling mesquite. And now, NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen with host Kevin Oxner. Hello and welcome to NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kevin Ochsner. Thanks for joining us. Leading our news this week, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association is working to stop a proposal from the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, known as the Brazilian Rule. The proposal would allow the import into the United States of fresh and frozen beef from a region in Brazil that has had a recurrent issue with foot and mouth disease or FMD outbreaks. NCBA Vice President of Government Affairs Colin Woodall tells us more about this issue. The big issue that we have in regards to trade has to do with a proposed rule out of the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service at USDA which would allow Brazil to export fresh and frozen beef into the United States. Now even though we do support trade and we definitely support taking down trade barriers, we're a little concerned about this Brazil rule just because they continue to have a problem with foot and mouth disease and foot and mouth disease can be carried on fresh and frozen product. So we are working very hard to uh, fight this particular rule because even though trade is great, no trade is worth reintroduction of foot and mouth disease into the United States. It would just be devastating to our herd and devastating economically to our industry. Woodall says NCBA will be commenting on the proposal and is continuing to seek more information from the USDA to determine the real risks associated with importing beef from Brazil. The United States has been free of FMD since 1929. The Federal Endangered Species Act, or ESA, has been called one of the most economically damaging laws facing American livestock producers. When a species is listed as threatened or endangered, the resulting use restrictions placed on land and water can be crippling to a rancher. But with cooperative action, ranchers and conservationists can work together in restoring wildlife habitat and potentially avoiding an ESA designation. We learn more about the issue and the Sage Grouse initiative from Cattlemen to Cattlemen reporter Brad Bulla. The West was once covered in sagebrush, and the greater sage grouse thrived. Now, though you can still find plenty of sage, invasive juniper trees have spread across the land. The juniper, along with increased development, larger scale fires, and other issues, have resulted in a major decline in sage grouse populations. Sage grouse have been in decline for really 50 years in parts of the West. And uh, they occur across 11 Western states from South Dakota, North Dakota, all the way to California and Washington. But populations are cyclical, go up and down, but the trend over time has been declining. We've lost 50% of the historic habitat. And so the concern over sage grouse is that um, at some point we keep dwindling down to smaller and smaller populations and it's just harder to keep the species connected and persistent across uh, its historic range. In 2010, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service determined that the sage grouse warranted protection under the Endangered Species Act, but held off listing the bird at that time. That leaves the issue still an open question and a threat to those who rely on the land for their livelihood. So uh, I'm confident we can run cattle and and uh, be compatible with the sage grouse that are out here. But if, if we see a listing, I'm not quite so confident that we can uh, jump through the hoops of the Endangered Species Act and stay clear of litigation and the other problems that would uh, be caused by having to work with the Endangered Species Act on these permits. We're very concerned that if the bird is listed, it could have very negative impacts and lead to drastic cuts in livestock grazing on federal lands. So uh, we're engaged in that process. The decision by the Fish and Wildlife Service will be by September of 2015. So we're on a bit of a, sh a short timeline here on uh, working with the agencies to ensure that whatever happens with the sage grouse does not negatively impact livestock. But that also gave us a window of opportunity to go implement enough of the right practices in the right places to maybe um, stabilize sage-grouse populations, protect habitat, 
and uh, hopefully preclude the need to list the species altogether. And the species is up for review again in September of 2015 where the Fish and Wildlife Service will make a final determination as to whether or not it needs uh, federal regulatory protection. Now, with funding from NRCS, ranchers in much of the West are taking action that will help improve livestock grazing and at the same time improve habitat for the sage grouse. One example is large scale removal of invasive juniper trees with mechanical means, fire, and chemical treatments. To date, we've engaged over 700 individual ranches across 11 Western states, from the Dakotas all the way to the Pacific Coast. And, uh, We've implemented, through ranchers, uh, over 2 million acres of improved grazing systems, uh, over 200,000 acres of highly targeted juniper removal. Well, we've been uh, working at the junipers for a long time, probably for 35 years, and uh, we chipped away at them, and it hasn't been until recently when uh, the NRCS and the Sage Grouse Initiative was established that we could really uh, dive into it on a landscape scale, but now we can just block out, you know, several hundred acres and just remove juniper and that, that of course, uh, removes the seed source and creates a, a landscape change in the, in the habitat and uh, it, it's good for us, but it, it really fits what the sage grouse needs. So it's, it's been great that way that we've had the NRCS to partner with and and really do this. We really believe in the shared vision that, that we have here, which is that, you know, what's good for rangelands is good for sage grouse. And so a lot of the things that are threatening sage grouse also happen to undermine uh, the viability of a livestock ranch. And so when we deal with things like weeds or invasive juniper, um, we're also to help, helping to make that ranch more sustainable while uh, shoring up our wildlife populations, our watersheds, and, and other resources. On ranches across the West, the land is changing, and in many places, the sage grouse is returning. The hope is that enough progress can be made by September of 2015 that the Fish and Wildlife Service will make the decision not to list the sage grouse as an endangered species. There's really more at stake here than just uh, a species. What we're trying to do is demonstrate that voluntary and proactive conservation done by all the partners can turn the tide on the Endangered Species Act process. And it's important that and ranchers are in a unique spot to make a difference. And uh, all, throughout the West, you see places where ranchers are doing just that. And uh, hopefully this will get credit for all that's happened and a lot more will happen between now in 2015, September, when the decision's made, and we'll see ranching go on, and we'll see sage grouse go on, and we'll uh, have more generations of both. In sage grouse and cattle country in southern Oregon, I'm Brad Bullock for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. To keep up on issues such as the sage grouse and the Endangered Species Act, why not join NCBA? You can find out more by calling 1-866-USA-BEEF or by visiting the website beefusa.org. Still ahead on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Uh, I think parasites are costing most cow-calf producers in the spring a tremendous amount of money, more than we realize. We'll talk about increasing your profits by controlling cattle parasites. And next, we head to Texas for expert insights on effective tools in the battle against mesquite. Don't go away, we'll be right back. You're watching NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen on RFD TV. We don't sit idle wondering how we're going to build a better truck. We get out there and walk a mile, thousands of miles in the footsteps of the guys we build trucks for. The groundbreaking Ram Heavy Duty with 30,000 pounds of towing and 850 pound feet of torque. We stand for what we believe in. We believe in you. It's more than a job. It's your way of life. Who you are, where you live, and what you do. 
the way you treat your cattle, your family, your employees, and your neighbors, the water you drink, the air you breathe, and the ground you walk on. What you do every day gives families something to gather around every night. It's about doing what's right for your cattle, your land, your community, and your business. It's your livelihood, and it means as much to us as it does to you. We all believe in responsible beef. Let's stand together at responsiblebeef.com. Welcome back. One of the keys to success for cow-calf producers is providing adequate grass and forage for their cattle. But that job gets especially tough when invasive species such as mesquite are in the picture, choking out forage for both cattle and wildlife. For insight on ways to win the battle against mesquite, we turn to Cattleman to Cattleman reporter Candace Weta in Texas. For cattle operations here and in much of the Southwest, one of the biggest barriers to improved grazing and wildlife habitat is mesquite. We came to Texas to gain some insights from industry experts and producers who are experienced in battling mesquite. Mesquite uh, robs moisture that uh, we can sure use on our, on our rangelands. Mesquite is a very prolific plant down in the southwest. Um, Texas, it, it, it really is a big problem for us, probably our biggest noxious plant problem. So tell us how mesquite has negatively impacted the operation and why controlling it is so important for you all. Mesquite is a uh, real concern to us because it's, uh, it's an invasive species, it's very prolific, canopy cover, causes us problems, it, it uh, shades out our natural grasses and thus reducing our forage growth, less grazing ability. The problem is is that it comes in and basically makes a monoculture. Shades out a lot of our native grasses, um, not only causes a monoculture from a brush standpoint, but also from a, a forage diversity standpoint. Only certain types of plants can actually grow under a mesquite canopy. and so you can actually change a pasture quite dramatically just in the diversity of the forage plants with a mesquite uh, canopy coverage. Why is mesquite so difficult to control? Mesquite is very hard to control mainly because it's such a prolific re-sprouter from the crown of that plant, the base of that plant. We can actually go in and top kill mesquite by cutting it off, mowing it, shredding it. Um, fire or anything else and not kill that plant. Uh, it will re-sprout from the base so that the, the target when we're talking about killing mesquite is actually killing what's below ground and not what's above ground. Okay, uh, So that's one of the reasons it's, it's very difficult to control. With mesquite, we, it was uh, management program was developed over, out of necessity. Uh, it was, we were losing so many, so many acreage to mesquite, um, our hand was forced. Uh, we had to come up with something. Uh, Sendero was our best avenue. Tell us about your experience with Sendero here on the operation. Our experience with Sendero uh, has been very good. Uh, we've, we've been very happy with the results we've, we've received uh, using Sendero on our mesquite. We've been able to reduce our, our uh, mesquite population and our canopy cover significantly. Sendero, in conjunction with other management tools, have really helped us we, you know, incorporate that diversity and increase the diversity across the ranch. We started a mesquite research project back in about 2007, and over about a seven-year period, we came up with Sendero herbicide. And our goal with that project was to not only improve the mortality of, of mesquite control that we get from, from a herbicide, but also the consistency of that. What are some of the different ways that Sendero can be applied? Sendero can be applied in, in a multitude of ways. Um, mainly, we, we put it out with an airplane as an aerial application uh, in a low volume type situation. 
We'll do what we call individual plant treatment, uh, backpack type sprayers or uh, UTV or ATV type sprayers where we spray individual plants. Uh, we can spray the foliage uh, with Sendero and, and, and do a very good job with a little wider window of application. Why is timing so critical in the application of Sendero? With mesquite control, probably the number one thing that we really need to look at is proper timing. Um, and there's several factors that we want to look at. Um, we want to look at the time of year that we actually start spraying. Uh, and essentially what we want to see is, is we kind of start counting back after bud break. And we want uh, full leaf development and we want dark green leaves. Once we get those dark green leaves, then that we know that at that point it's a fully developed leaf and we're actually moving carbohydrates down into that root system. We talked about wanting to kill that root system. So we have to, we have, to have the carbohydrates moving down in that plant and going to the root system. So the timing to do that is very critical. What are the advantages of having selectivity in mesquite management? Through the research project for Sendero, uh, one of the things that we began to notice is, is how selective it was to, to mesquite and we started noticing how it was leaving some of the more desirable species unharmed, such as our oaks, such as our bromelias, such as our lope bushes and things like that that are important wildlife species. The selectivity of, of, of Sendero herbicide is really an important part of it today, mainly because of the fact that landowners, in, in, in specifically in Texas, but, but most of the Southwest, are beginning to utilize their land more from a wildlife standpoint uh, compared to, to cattle. Now there's still obviously lots of cattle producers out there, but, but a lot of those cattle producers also have a benefit from their wildlife populations in terms of economic income and things like that. Using Sendero, the selectivity of it actually gives us a benefit of leaving some of our desirable species. Those desirable species are important for wildlife habitat. Okay, Some of that might be from a nesting cover standpoint. Um, some of it might be from just a protection cover standpoint. Uh, and it might be a browse type species. But those desirable species are very important from a wildlife habitat standpoint. Being able to decrease the mesquite and increase the diversity of, of the desirable browse and forbs has uh, given us the ability to increase the, uh, the quality and quantity of our deer herd. Uh, our bobwhite quail population has been gaining ground. Uh, whereas most place, other places, there's an opposite trend from that. We'll have more from Texas Uncontrolling Mesquite when we return. Stay with us. This is yours, and so is what grows there. Not theirs, or theirs, yours. You need this to fight this, and this to grow more this. Because the more of this you feed them, the less this you spend on that, which leaves more of this here. Don't let them take this from you. Chaparral takes care of weeds and brush, and that's that. The Case IH Spring Sales Event is on now, making it a great time to get the equipment you need for this season. With 0% financing for 60 months on all Farmall and Maxim Series tractors, as well as our complete line of hay tools, you can turn everyday chores into everyday savings. But hurry, the Spring Sales Event ends June 30th, 2014. For more information, ask your local Case IH dealer or go to caseih.com slash special offers. Want to help elect officials who understand the needs of the cattle industry? Then visit BeefUSA.org and check out the NCBA Political Action Committee online auction page. There, NCBA members can view and bid on a wide variety of exciting travel and merchandise, and the funds go to support NCBA's work in Washington, D.C. You must be a member to contribute to NCBA PAC, so don't wait. Join today.
Welcome back. Now let's return to Cattleman to Cattleman reporter Candace Weta in Texas for more on controlling mesquite to benefit both cattle grazing and wildlife habitat. The unchecked invasion of mesquite can cut forage production by 60 to 70 percent. Dr. Jim Ansley with Texas A&M has been researching new ways to win the battle against mesquite. People have traditionally done brush sculpting with mechanical treatments, where you take a bulldozer out there and, or some other big piece of heavy equipment and clear lanes, uh, either uprooting plants or knocking them over. And that obviously is very exact. You can do that exactly where you want to, but the problem with that is typically, unless you're pulling the plant out by the root system, you typically get the re-sprouting that occurs. And so all of that investment, maybe sometimes $300, $400 an acre, all of that investment goes by the wayside uh, in five, 10 years because of the re-sprouting. And, and then you're looking at a, at a re-sprouting forest of mesquite that's even worse than you had it before. Sendero can do that for a much cheaper cost. And the other nice thing about it is that you've root killed most of those mesquite in there. And so they're not gonna re-sprout. And so the, the longevity of keeping that area open is much, much longer, you know, 30, 40 years. How does Sendero bring value to cattle producers who are looking to control mesquite for grazing purposes as well as for wildlife? So it's, it's really more of a, of a, of a difference in in what you want to do in, in different spaces on that landscape. Uh, Sendero is, is uh, uh, as a product, it, 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 it's very good about not drifting. And so it, it, you can be very exacting as to where you want to uh, spray Sendero. So if you want to have a 30 acre area of, of open land that is currently infested by mesquite, but you would like to convert that more to an open grassland uh, or maybe a grassland that has some of the better shrubs in it for forage value, uh, Sendero can be used for that. But you may want an area right next to that that you still want to keep as, as a dense patch of mesquite or some other brush species for wildlife habitat. So the nice thing about a product like Sendero is that it allows you to do that. You can, you can, you can do that brush sculpting in a very exact manner. So if a producer is looking to restore their pasture for the purpose of grazing as well as wildlife, where should they start? The first place to start would be to really try to get a good inventory of how that brush is distributed on, on that area. You usually have quite a bit of variation in that brush density. And what I would recommend is that typically in the areas that have the most dense mesquite that's where you're gonna have the least grass production and probably the most, the most deterioration of your grass community. In my opinion, that's not the best place to start. I would work on, I mean, if, you, if resources are limited and you realize that you can't spray the entire pasture, you don't have the resources to spray the entire pasture, and you may want to have a little bit of wildlife habitat in addition if that's one of your goals. I would work on the areas that are maybe a little bit less dense, that still have a pretty good grass community, that you can get a, be a better bang for your buck uh, when you spray that immediately because that grass community will respond faster. There's no doubt left untreated, mesquite will take over a pasture and leave little or no grazing for cattle or habitat for wildlife. That's why new tools in the effort to manage and control mesquite are so eagerly welcomed by producers. In Texas, I'm Candace Weta reporting for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. For more information on mesquite control and Sendero herbicide, call toll free 1 888 346 6910. By calling, you can sign up to receive this informational brochure on Sendero herbicide and more. It's easy, just call us at 1 888 346-6910. Still ahead, we'll have a report on modified live vaccines. And next, we'll learn about controlling cattle parasites. Stay with us. New Holland is smart for the way you farm. 
And New Holland Round Balers are smart for the way you raise cattle. By focusing on making the densest bale possible, New Holland Round Balers pack more into each bale, saving you time, fuel, and money. Now that's smart. We can also match your feeding requirements with a variety of bale slicing, cutting, and wrapping options to help maximize your time. Plus, with models designed specifically for silage or specialty crop harvest, New Holland gives you the power to make smart choices to fit your farm or ranch. You work hard to get the most out of every hay season to benefit you and your cattle. From mower conditioners to balers and tractors, New Holland has the right solutions to help you make quality hay and forage for your cattle operation. Visit your New Holland dealer to learn more about the complete lineup of New Holland equipment, in addition to all the benefits available to cattle producers. I'm an NCBA member because NCBA, they look at the facts, they look at the history, and they look what's good for the industry. It's important to be NCBA members just because of what NCBA does. They keep us informed about a lot of things that are going on nationwide. The reason we're an NCBA member is we think that it's the best voice that the cattle people have. Join NCBA today. Head to BeefUSA.org or call 866-USA-BEEF. Cattlemen and women know the importance of building a solid animal health protocol. Parasite control is one of the best ways producers can keep cattle healthy and productive. For more on the benefits of parasite control, Cattlemen and Cattlemen reporter Brian Baxter has the story. In northeast Missouri, Charles Swiger has been working the land and raising cattle at Swiger Farms for over 30 years. You know, I guess you'd say that uh, we bet we was in the Hereford business for my grandfather started the Hereford business back in, I think, in 29, and we've had horned Hereford and then went to pole Hereford in the early 90s and bought our first Angus cows in 94, and that's kind of where we started from. To find new ways to improve the herd health on his operation, Swiger has worked with his veterinarian, Dr. Hunt Tainer. The two have searched for animal health products that will ultimately increase the operation's return on investment. So Charles and I have been working together for, gosh, probably 12 to 14 years. Um, they run a registered Angus Hereford as well as a commercial herd. Uh, ultimately, you know, we got uh, started AIing cows here, preg checking for them, and we've just tried to get a little bit more aggressive with management uh, each year as we've gone. As it is in many areas of the country, pasture availability in Missouri can be a challenge for cattle producers. To make the most of the acres that are available for grazing, parasite control is critical. So I think in Missouri, uh, especially today with you know ground being hard to come by, people oftentimes overgraze or overstock their pastures. Uh, I think parasites are costing most cow-calf producers in the spring a tremendous amount of money, more than we realize. You know, that's been a hard thing to get people to change. They've typically, if they're going out to grass right now in early to mid-April, they want to deworm them and be finished. Uh, up until this point, there have not been no products available that had any uh, sustained release or long-acting effect. So, so we still had an open window where parasites could be costing us money in the long term. In search of season-long parasite control, Dr. Tainer and Charles used long range on a cow herd during last year's grazing season. The results they saw after using long range were substantial. So it was early June when we gave the cows long range, uh, recorded the weights on the calves when they came through the chute. They already sorted in their respective pastures. Uh, gave long-range cows and calves, and 114 days later, when we weaned, uh, we reweighed. They're all in the same group and tallied up the the difference in average daily gains in them, and, and were pleasantly surprised with the results. It really wasn't until at night that we ran the data and saw that we had a difference in average daily gain uh, in the long-range cattle. So that's really where the the meat of it is. I mean, there was a tremendous amount of money on the table there. Of course, this year, you know, we used long-range and was really sold on it so far. You know, and uh, Felt like it was, you know, money well spent, so to speak. We're going to do it on everything this time for sure. But I figured that, uh, you know, that the advantage of it is is the extra pounds on the calves, and 
at two dollars a pound it just uh, adds up to me that's it's worth it you know because i know it's going to pay since long range is labeled for parasite control for up to 100 to 150 days the cattle are protected for the entire grazing season Dr. Tainer notes that the extended duration of long range means producers only have to treat once in the spring for parasites, a labor savings that all producers can appreciate. To me, the hard part in the past has always been getting clients to uh, bring the cattle up in June, deworm. Uh, much more convenient now that we've got a product long, like long range, we can go back to deworming at turnout in April uh, and May and get season long control, uh, whereas before, you know, either cattle were getting done right at turnout or they're having to bring them back up later and, and uh, they weren't getting the full effect of parasite control. Well, it's a lot less handling of the cattle. I mean, it's just less trips through the chute. It all takes time and labor and dollars. We've had times when winter we've had to bring cattle in and retreat, you know, before grass time and uh, we haven't seen anything like that this time. After seeing success with the product themselves, both Swiger and Dr. Tainer encourage other beef producers to try long range on their own operation. Try it. <laughs> you know, just try it. Personally, I think they'll see the difference whether they weigh the calves or whether they don't weigh the calves. You know, I think they'll see the difference in the cow and the performance, you know, the cows. I think every producer owes it to themselves to have a control group and a treatment group, a group that they use long range on because there's so many environmental differences from year to year. Uh, just taking one, one year's weaning weight versus the previous years is it, hard to really compare. So I do think everybody owes it to themselves. They owe it to themselves to at least do a group. Parasites are robbing pounds of growth off these calves. And, and at today's market at $2 a pound plus, uh, it's costing a tremendous amount of money. So what an opportune time to, to take advantage of the uh, money left on the table with the long, long acting product. To me, it's pretty simple because, you know, if you're going to have pounds at $2 a pound, it don't cost that much to treat, you know. Besides, I think the cattle are in better shape and better condition. With season-long parasite control with long range, throughout the herd, calves grow faster and profitability increases, something all producers are looking for. Reporting from Northeast Missouri, I'm Brian Baxter for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Here is some important safety information. Do not treat within 48 days of slaughter. Not for use in female dairy cattle 20 months of age or older, including dry dairy cows or in veal calves. Post-injection site damage can occur. These reactions have disappeared without treatment. Find out more at the website, thelongrangelook.com. Still ahead, we'll spend some time with the cowboy poet Baxter Black. And next, we'll tell you about the Cattle Feeders Hall of Fame. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Yes! <laughs> Joe! Todd! How'd you do? Oh, not bad. See what you have to gain at thelongrangelook.com. No storm is too powerful for New Purina wind and rain storm minerals, formulated with ultimate weather resistance. That means more minerals in the feeder and available to your cattle. Wind and rain storm minerals provide more consistent intake and balanced mineral nutrition to optimize herd health and breedback rates. See the difference at your local Purina dealer or visit CattleNutrition.com. Wind and rain storm minerals, another way Purina is building better cattle. It's always enjoyable to see those who work so hard in the beef industry gain some appreciation and recognition for their efforts. The Cattle Feeders Hall of Fame marked its fifth anniversary last year, and we learned more about the purpose of this organization and the most recent honorees from Cattleman to Cattleman reporter Brian Baxter. 
Seven days a week, cattle feeders care for their animals, delivering feed, water, and attention in every kind of weather. At times, it may seem like a thankless job. But once each year, those who've made a difference are honored at the Cattle Feeders Hall of Fame. It was actually five years ago when uh, several of us got together and decided to form the Cattle Feeders Title Hall of Fame and, and uh, we became one of the founding sponsors and we realized how important it is to the industry to recognize these people who have really, really uh, provided the, the basis for this industry. They're, they're, it's a heritage of, of cattle feeding and to honor these people is, is something very special. And there are a lot of people that are uh, important to the cattle feeding industry. They brought a lot of jobs to the to the plains uh, and, and to the industry in general. Uh, plus, they've added a lot of value to the cattle and to the grains and to the farmers that uh, provide grains to the industry. So, uh, it is a, a critical industry for America. Cattle feeding is uh, one of our nation's oldest and her most heritage-rich uh, agricultural occupations. It uh, has some of our greatest heroes, and uh, we're celebrating some of them tonight. And uh, we feel like we need to tell that story of cattle feeding, its history, and its future. It was an evening of celebration in Denver as four individuals were honored at the 2013 Cattle Feeders Hall of Fame event. One of those was the late Leo Timmerman, who started cattle feeding in the 1940s. Their legacy is phenomenal. Uh, uh, Leo was one of the pioneers. Uh, you go back and read the history and listen to some of the stories of how he started and when he started. And he was one of those guys that not only was successful, but he helped build the industry and create the opportunities for everybody else to follow. My father was brought up in the Depression. And if, as long as you wanted to work hard, you always had something to eat. And he was always told us the same thing. Work hard and don't worry about it. And, and today, I believe hard work is very important and business sense is very important. Another pioneer in the cattle feeding business now newly added to the Hall of Fame is the late Louis Dinklage, a highly successful Nebraska-based cattle feeder. He was a huge part of the cattle feeding fabric I knew when I grew up. Louis would have probably been 55, about what I am now, uh, when I was born. And uh, he had a great impact on my life and many of those that fed cattle in Wisner and Cumming County. Also given during the Cattle Feeders Hall of Fame event is the Industry Leadership Award that recognizes outstanding individuals for their contributions to the beef and cattle feeding industries. The 2013 winner was Harry Kenobi of Nebraska. I'm extremely honored and proud to, to present this to Harry. Um, I think back when I moved back, I was born and raised in the area, but when I moved back to kind of go into the operation, uh, Harry was right there for me all the time. And uh, he's been there for everybody. And I think the biggest thing that you can say about Harry is what he'll always say to you is be a part of something bigger than yourself. And if there's one thing that Harry has lived for and showed the industry is, is that. Beyond honoring individuals, the Cattle Feeders Hall of Fame is also working to preserve the heritage of the cattle feeding business with a project aimed at capturing historic journals, film, and photos to be preserved in an archive. We're going to ask people to send that in. Um, they can contact us for going to the cattlefeeders.org website and just send a request in and, and we will get the information to them to send the photos or whatever they have in. We will take care of digitizing it and then return it to the family that sent it. Preserving the past and honoring those who've made a lasting contribution to the cattle feeding industry. From the Cattle Feeders Hall of Fame event in Denver, I'm Brian Baxter for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Still ahead, we'll visit with Baxter Black. And next, we'll learn about modified live vaccines. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hi there, I'm Joey. And I'm Rory, and welcome to our farm outside Nashville, Tennessee. When we go to work, whether it's on tour or here at home, we wear the West. That's right, wear it's that perfect snap shirt or that perfect pair of boots. When you wear Roper, you wear the West. Learn more about us, Joey and Rory, and about Roper Western wear at eroper.com. Telling the truth and being real and feeding my 
my family a home cooked meal that's important to me. That's important to me. And planting the garden and watching it grow. Welcome back. A crucial part of keeping cattle healthy is a solid vaccination program. Modified live virus or MLV vaccines help provide protection against disease, especially reproductive diseases, when properly used. For more on the benefits of MLV vaccines, Brian Baxter has the report. And now a management minute discussing MLV vaccines brought to you by Zoetis. In beef cattle, research demonstrates that modified live virus vaccines help provide efficacy and duration of immunity when compared to killed vaccines in helping prevent reproductive diseases such as BVD, persistent infections, and IBR abortions. We turn to two experienced veterinarians, Dr. Dan Scruggs and Dr. Tim Dawson, for some specifics on the value of MLV vaccinations. It's important to protect the cow against any reproductive disease because the investments you have in these animals that are bred um, is pretty substantial. Modified live vaccines closely mimics what the natural exposure to the disease is. The reason that's important is those modified live vaccines stimulate the immune system in a more comprehensive manner. That's why we have much better label claims, especially for fetal protection, with the modified live vaccines, invest in a vaccine that provides the highest and longest level of protection. Dr. Dawson has specialized in beef cattle for almost 30 years. Under his guidance, 99% of his clients with 70,000 head of cattle collectively now use an MLV vaccination program and the number of reproductive disease problems has been drastically reduced. And today we're seeing from maybe treating two head out of 400, which is a half of percent. And that's the kind of effect with integrating modified live vaccines into these cow herds, not only the pregnant dam, but timely vaccinations of these calf crops as they mature through the course of a calendar year. In this particular area, we use a lot of Bovishield, we use a lot of PregGuard 10. Our success has been very good. MLV vaccines such as Bovishield Gold FP and PregGuard Gold FP offer not only demonstrated duration of immunity but also reproductive protection, meaning clinical disease is prevented in both the cow and the calf. And when used according to the label, the chance for an adverse reaction is very small. Those incidences of reproductive loss due to the fetal protection vaccine is a very small percentage. With cattle prices reaching all-time highs, it's more important than ever for cow-calf producers to be proactive about their reproductive vaccination programs and make sure a healthy, productive calf hits the ground next spring. Using the technical expertise of a veterinarian makes implementing an MLV vaccine program a seamless process. When you're making the decision as to whether or not to use modified live or killed vaccines, you weigh in what the overall effectiveness of the vaccine is. If we can achieve the level of immunity we need to protect that cow from reproductive losses, then we can safely use the modified live vaccines on the nursing calf. Springtime when they're branding, if they're in a facility where you can then start those cows in a modified live, like in a preg guard situation or a bova shield FP situation, it's very important to do. And the people that aren't on this, on board on good solid vaccine programs are suffering um, less gross income in the marketplace. In Southeast Wyoming, I'm Brian Baxter reporting for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Implementing or transitioning to a modified live virus vaccine program requires planning and sound details about your herd. To review your options for comprehensive vaccine protection, work with your veterinarian to fine-tune your animal health program. 
Visit bovashieldgold.com for more information. Coming up next, a visit with Baxter Black and more of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Stay with us. This business can take time away and become more of your family than your actual family. My days were tough. I had a lot of doctoring, a lot of pulling. Now our days on the feed yard are happy days. It's more about looking at the cattle and enjoying what we're producing versus the alternative which is pull and treat and bang our head against the wall. We have never wavered from Draxon. We've seen the benefits just keep getting better and better. It's the official monthly publication of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. The National Cattlemen is produced exclusively for NCBA members and includes coverage of the news and events affecting our industry. From Capitol Hill to the far side of cattle country, the National Cattlemen provides information NCBA members need. Every issue includes market analysis, feature stories, and practical management tips. Start receiving your copy of The National Cattlemen. Call 866-USA-BEEF or go online to beefusa.org and join today. Lots of cowmen put a little extra into their calves, hoping it'll bring them another nickel at the sale, like preconditioning, early weaning, or for specialty markets. But how can the buyer trust your claim? Old vaccine bottles or your ratty tally book? Truth is, this little green ear tag will be all you need. That's what IMI Global does. Third party verification. A seal of approval, like the nutrition label on your Twinkie. Can I say Twinkie? IMIGlobal.com. Let's face it. You don't think a lot about your trailer hitch. You use it and forget it. We understand. But at B&W, we think about it. Short nights, long hauls, never-ending chores. The unthinkable. We think about it all, so you don't have to. B&W. Trusted. Timber and Jesse agreed to gather some wild cattle that were night grazing in a local farmer's cotton fields. To complicate things, the cows only came at night, which eliminated using horses. Well, their plan involved a tranquilizer gun. Our boys arrived loaded for bear. Jesse had taped a flashlight to his dart gun, and Timber carried a tie-down rope, a flashlight, and was wearing a miner's helmet, complete with <coughs> headlamp. Well, after two misses, Jesse fired at a crossbred bull and hit him. The bull began to wobble. When he dropped to the ground, Timber was on him like a coon dog on a ham sandwich. He rolled the bull sideways and hog-tied him. Well, the bull began to struggle and pushed back and pushed back, and Timber tried to hold his ground, thinking, surely the tranquilizer will soon take effect. But the opposite seemed to be happening. The bull was waking up. Timber was whacking him with his flashlight, his miner's lamp bouncing crazily in the dark from the distance. All Jesse could see were two beams of light, like Obi-Wan Kenobi and Slim Skywalker going at it with lightsabers. Well, the bull stumbled to his feet with Timber still draped over his back. Again, from Jesse's point of view, they appeared to be two inebriated friends who had lost their car keys in the middle of the night. Well, Timber fell off and hit the ground with a thud. The flashlight broke, but he was still dragging along behind on that foot rope. The bull finally stopped and then turned around. He saw a wild predator beast with one bright shining cycloptic eye in the middle of his head. He did what any 900 pound king of the hill testosterone toro would do. He charged. <coughs> well, Jesse saw it all. The one beam of light that danced and banged and flipped and flew in a firecracker ballet until it finally lay still shining askew, a lone beacon in the night sky. Jesse ran to the light. Over here, said Timber, 10 feet away. Did you see where he went? South, said Jesse, towards Mexico. 
Good, said Timber. Maybe I'll meet up with him again someday in a taco. This is Baxter Black from Alexander. Thanks, Baxter. We always enjoy experiencing those cowboy adventures through your eyes. There's more Cattlemen to Cattlemen still ahead, so stay with us. This isn't a job, it's a calling. Your hard work helps feed the world. Being linked to those who care for the land is our calling. For more than 175 years, John Deere has been a proud partner of the cattle business. That's why we bring you special NCBA member discounts, so you can get the right equipment. Strong, rugged, versatile, and ready to work hard. Talk to your John Deere dealer to learn more about your NCBA member discounts. John Deere, committed to the land, committed to your success. Hello, I'm Kevin Oxner, host of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Each week, we travel the country to bring you the latest cattle industry news and information. Check us out at cattlemantocattlemen.org or on Facebook and Twitter. Join your fellow cattlemen in sizzling hot San Antonio for the 2015 Cattle Industry Annual Convention and NCBA Trade Show. It's the beef industry's biggest convention, and it's great for education, networking, and fun. Plus, you can check out the NCBA Trade Show for the latest technology. It's the 2015 Cattle Industry Annual Convention and NCBA Trade Show in sizzling hot San Antonio, Texas, February 4th through 7th. Visit BeefUSA.org for more. Welcome back. Now it's not too early to mark your calendar for the Cattle Industry Summer Conference. It's a great opportunity to meet your fellow cattlemen and women. Plus, spend time planning for the future of your operation and our great industry. The Summer Conference is set for July 30th through August 2nd in Denver, Colorado. For details, call 1-866-USA-BEEF or visit us at beefusa.org. Well, that's our time for this edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you right back here next week on RFD TV.